I've been working in the field of intimate partner violence since 1978, first as an advocate for battered women at Women's Shelter in Long Beach, and then in 1979, I founded one of the first programs in the country to work with perpetrators of domestic violence, and I continue to do that work. The interaction of gender, power, and violence is a recurring theme. Gender, power, and violence played a major role in the 2016 presidential election, and most recently in the Kavanaugh hearings. Repercussions from those hearings on all sides of the issues have reverberated around the country. I was watching The Daily Show the other night with Trevor Noah, and he was interviewing America Ferrara, and he said to her, how did you feel about the hearings? And she said, how long are women's lives and dignity going to be secondary to the needs of powerful men? What with the Me Too movement, one powerful, prominent figure after another has fallen from grace. So we start to learn something about gender expectations when we exit the birth canal. But for most children, fairy tales are an early entree to the wonderful world of gender roles. What with Disney films and mass media, the demand for prince and princess costumes and accessories are a worldwide phenomenon. And we learn a lot from fairy tales. You know, fairy tales are replete with iconic heroes and heroines and villains. And they teach us something about good and evil, about right and wrong. They teach us about truth and lies, and a lot about black and white thinking because there's not much nuance in fairy tales. So I'm going to take you on a sentimental journey back to your own childhoods. I'm going to ask you to flash back to when you were four, five, six, seven, eight years old. And I'm going to ask you to think about the friends you had and what kind of games you played, and think about your favorite toys. Do you remember when uh, G.I. Joe used to be like a normal-sized guy with a, an appropriately sized gun? G.I. Joe has gotten a lot larger. He's apparently been taking steroids, and, and his gun just keeps getting bigger. As they say, sometimes a banana is just a banana, Anna. And then there's Barbie. At one point, you could move Barbie's arms up and down, and her chest just kept getting bigger. Barbie, who now is built like most of us never were. Now, I'm going to ask you to go a little deeper into your childhoods and to think about the characters you pretended to be when you were growing up. Characters you pretended to be when you were playing with your friends, or characters you pretended to be in the privacy of your own minds. And I'm going to ask you to imagine those make-believe personas are the characters from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Not the uh, Grimm Brothers version, because that's very depressing, but the Disney cartoon classic. And I'm also going to ask you to raise your hands when I talk about a character that you pretended to be. So let's start with Snow White's father. How many of you pretended to be Snow White's father? You're looking around like, who is that guy? <laughs> well, Snow White's father is kind of emblematic of a lot of fathers in fairy tales. He's absent, emotionally impotent. He doesn't protect his children, and he makes lousy marital choices. Now, if you don't think we're affected and our perceptions of fathers have not been affected by what we read as children, think about the traditional role of fathers in a child's life. Think about how they've been portrayed in film and how they've been portrayed in movies and, and on television. It's only recently that we see portrayals of fathers as very involved with their children 
and articles that talk about the significance of a father's role in a child's emotional development. Now, how many of you pretended to be Snow White's mother? Yeah, she's dead. Um, <laughs> so, so most of the mothers in fairy tales are missing, which allows us to segue into the next character. Without thinking more than a couple seconds, think about the words you use or the words that come to mind when you hear the term stepmother. Now, for most of us, we go to evil, mean, cold, hard-hearted, ambitious, self-absorbed. Many of us have never had a stepmother, but we certainly know how to describe them. So how many of you pretended to be Snow White's stepmother, hashtag queen, hashtag witch? <laughs> now, she's overtly the most powerful woman in the fairy tale. But what kind of words do we use in this culture when we talk about powerful women? Oftentimes, we use the same adjectives that we do to describe Snow White's stepmother. Now, the other thing about her stepmother is that she was angry. Think about when in this culture women are praised for their anger. Usually in defense of their children. If they get angry in their own self-defense, think about what we call them. That would be crazy, hysterical, emotional, B-word for 200, Alex. Now, are there any aspiring dwarfs in the audience? Anybody aspire to be one of the seven dwarfs? Think about them because they are so lovable. We liked the, the, the dwarfs. They made Snow White feel safe. And most of us remember happy and dark and grumpy and dopey and seem to forget bashful and sleepy and sneezy. But uh, I was talking to one group, and one of the men in the audience said, you know, I kind of wanted to be a cross between happy and grumpy. And I said, oh, you wanted to be humpy, the, <laughs> the eighth and most elusive of all the dwarves. <laughs> Let's think about the hero in Snow White, the hero kind of character. How many of you pretended to be a prince, hero type character? And don't be embarrassed, I'm talking about when you were little. But think about how we describe the prince. Think about how we describe heroes. Well, generally male, generally white, heterosexual, handsome, rich, brave, daring, courageous, and they always look great in tights. <laughs> they also like to rescue women, many of whom are unconscious. <laughs> they kiss them. The woman wakes up. They fall immediately in love. And they live happily ever after. This is the birth of magical thinking. What do we learn about being male, about being a hero, and about foreplay? So let's think about the remaining character, Snow White, the princess. I went to my granddaughter's fifth birthday party uh, this summer, and I was surrounded by four, five, and six-year-old princesses that were just adorable. So think about the princess, and how many of you pretended to be that kind of a character? Well, what do we know about her? Well, she's female. She's generally white. She's heterosexual. She's pretty. She's kind and nurturing. She knows how to talk to animals. She's generally traumatized, so she needs rescuing. 
She seldom gets angry despite how she's treated. And most of the heroines had kind of mediocre singing voices. I am wishing, I am wishing for the one I love to find him, to find him someday, someday. Thank you for that. I'm selling a medley of my greatest hits in the back of the room. So think about what we learn from fairy tales. We learn something about being male and female. We learn something about relationships. The prince kisses a narcoleptic woman. She regains consciousness, and they ride off into the sunset. If you are female, and you suffer enough, you'll get your happy ending. And if you are a person of color, or gay, lesbian, or transgendered, you probably need to write your own fairy tale. What happens with fairy tales? We don't get sequels. We don't get Snow White and the Prince seven years later. <laughs> Snow White and the Prince life after children. The prince deals with erectile dysfunction. <laughs> Snow White has a hot flash. <laughs> you get my drift. If we stay true to our prescribed roles, our, we get our happy ending. But the truth is, most of us don't fit nicely into roles. In fact, many of us find that roles are confining, and that roles are restrictive. I think about the young women who just entered a Massachusetts uh, trade school, and they fell in love with plumbing. And I think about the young man I just saw in So You Think You Can Dance, who was an excellent football player, but fell in love with dance and decided to become a dancer. Or the women who absolutely love their careers and find fulfillment in their lives and make a conscious choice not to have children, or the men who value the quality of their lives and their nurturing abilities and become teachers and nurses. What if we decide to take a different path? We know through research that prior to adolescence, young girls and boys have about the same levels of self-confidence and self-esteem, but at adolescence, those levels dip down for girls. Is there something in childhood stories that makes us afraid to be different? The attitudes and beliefs that we develop as children create emotional reflexes that can get in our way later. Are we afraid to be gentle men and strong women? Because it's fear that keeps us from being honest, from being vulnerable, from defending ourselves and defending others. And although Disney protagonists and storylines have changed over the last decade, it can take generations for beliefs and attitudes to change. I was talking to some of the young women in my Psychology of Women class, and they said, you know, we feel like we need to kind of dumb down, that we can't act as smart as we are or be as assertive as we are because no one will want to be with us. We won't get a boyfriend. And I was thinking about one of the men in my program who came up and said, you know, Alice, I'd rather fight 10 men than tell a woman how I feel. And I remember when my son came home from college and we were talking about relationships, and he said, you know, Mom, it's hard to think differently than the other guys. We're all capable of misusing power, but the chronic misuse of power does not come from strength. It comes from weakness, and it comes from fear. And it's not usually fear of physical harm. 
It's fear of being rejected or embarrassed, fear of, fear of being humiliated or judged. One of the most important things and the most important tasks we have as human beings is to confront our own fears and to become sheroes and heroes in our own lives. And by the way, the man who uh, said he was afraid to tell a woman how he felt came into groups months later with a real hope story. And he said, you know, my girlfriend had a stroke and I'm bathing her and I'm feeding her and I'm caring for her and I'm admiring her strength and courage going through her healing and I never knew I could be this kind of a man. Isn't that what we all want? To look into our own magic mirrors and like who we see? Thank you very much.